Hello and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Smoke and Mirrors, Electronic Cigarettes and Child Health. Today's program is supported in part by the Pediatric Pulmonary Center at UAB. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for the training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, the CE credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on April 30, 2017, and two years for social workers, expiring on April 30, 2018. And now, let's meet our faculty presenters today. Dr. Susan Wally, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and Children's of Alabama, and Dr. Ann Slattery, Managing Director of the Regional Poison Control Center at Children's of Alabama. Welcome to you both, and let's get started. Thank you, Claire, and welcome, everyone. I'm very excited today to share a topic which I think is very important, electronic cigarettes. And so today our objectives are going to be review electronic cigarette nomenclature and components. We're going to discuss electronic cigarette user patterns and trends, review available scientific evidence of health concerns, not only for the user with the safety of the devices and the aerosol, but also for the non-user and the second and third hand aerosol exposure. We're going to touch on poisoning risks, and my colleague, Dr. Slattery, is going to be going over those risks of poisonings in the second hour. And then we're going to be talking about the public health concerns. Um, those of you in public health know that tobacco is one of the most lethal um, components that we can be using that kills one out of every three people who use it. So we've made a lot of progress in tobacco control, and we want to make sure that that doesn't go slide backwards. So we're going to talk about the potential for electronic cigarettes to glamorize and renormalize smoking. We've got some videos to see on that. And then the addiction potential. We're worried about our youth and uh, be becoming addicted to nicotine. And then the data or lack of data on use of electronic cigarettes as a smoking cessation device. So let's get started. So as a speaker, I want to tell you what I'm going to tell you, tell you it, and then remind you what I've told you. So we're going to start with the take-home points for today. Um, most of you know that our use and awareness of electronic cigarettes has skyrocketed over the past few years, and we'll look at some of that data. We know that electronic cigarette solution and aerosol are not harmless water vapor. They've been found to contain toxicants, including nicotine, as well as carcinogens, cancer-causing agents. And then we know that electronic cigarettes often contain nicotine, as I just mentioned, and that is a tobacco product. And if there's one takeaway from this talk that I want to make sure everybody understands is that we're talking about a tobacco product here. Um, in terms of recommended actions, um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, we do not recommend that children be exposed to electronic cigarettes, the electronic cigarette aerosol, or the electronic cigarette solution. And in clinical practice, for those like myself who I'm a hospitalist at Children's, uh, it's very important for us to be screening children and adults for electronic cigarette use when asking about tobacco. In 2014, more youth were using electronic cigarettes than any other tobacco product. So it's very important that we screen children for that use. We want to counsel children and adults not to use electronic cigarettes. And if they are using, offer or recommend tobacco dependence treatment based on their level of addiction. And then electronic cigarettes should not be recommended for smoking cessation due to limited evidence. So what exactly is electronic cigarette? Um, you can see in this picture, and I have many examples of things that are all considered electronic cigarettes. 
Uh, in the picture that you see, you see a wide variety from at the very top of your screen, something that might be more commonly known as a vape pen. Um, and even in that um, list of different types of electronic cigarettes, you see something that looks almost exactly like a cigar and known as e-cigars. So we'll go through these a little bit more. But the terminology, I think, is uh, rapidly changing and difficult for people such as myself and researchers to keep up with. Oftentimes in the published literature, um, electronic cigarettes will be known as electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS. So you may hear of some people, including myself, refer to uh, electronic cigarettes uh, as ENDS. Of course, e-cigarettes, uh, we already talked about an example of an e-cigar. Uh, E-hookah or hookah sticks is something that you might hear youth use. Vaping devices, vape pens, personal vaporizers, and mechanical mods or tanks are all basically what we consider as electronic cigarettes. So despite this variety in both the terminology and in look, there are several components to electronic cigarettes which are very similar. So I have an example in front of me and um, what you'll generally see is that you have a mouthpiece and then there's a cartridge which in this model is refillable. So you can put whatever e-cigarette uh, solution, also known as e-liquid, in this to fill up and then you have a rechargeable battery. Uh, this model here is um, one that you would reuse, but they also have disposable models. Um, what happens is when the user takes a, a vape or vapes or takes a, a drag like you might with a conventional cigarette, there's a sensor that either detects that change in flow or in this model you would press this button and what it does is there's an atomizer that heats up this liquid and aerosolizes it and that's what the user is going to draw in when they take a breath and then they will exhale the secondhand vapor. So most electronic cigarettes have very similar components. Oftentimes there's also a light at the end of the electronic cigarette that lights up, that simulates the flame that you might see with the conventional cigarette. So, you know, for our youth and uh, for people who might just be passing by, this picture that I'm showing you on the slide looks very much like a conventional cigarette. And the aerosol, uh, which is commonly known as a vapor, is oftentimes indistinguishable, especially to our, our children, our young children, our youth. So this next um, video will be an example of what uh, you might see when somebody's using a vaping device or electronic cigarette. And you can see just these huge plumes of smoke which have been advertised as har harmless water vapor. And I'll show you some evidence to the contrary. But there is a whole culture of um, vaping and using the clouds and plumes uh, in creative ways. So again, here is a picture of some of the different varieties of electronic cigarettes. And on the far left is an actual conventional cigarette, a traditional cigarette. You can see the next picture is an Enjoy, uh, which is a disposable e-cigarette, which virtually looks exactly the same. The next is the blue cigarette that um, is probably one of the most commonly recognized simply because of the advertising. And then you go to see in the middle, e-hookah, and then on the far right, what might be more traditionally thought of as a vaping pen, similar to this Enjoy model that I have here. Uh, you can see that the top screws off. You can actually charge this when your battery is dead and uh, put it into a USB, very convenient to continue using. All right, so where are electronic cigarettes sold? Um, and many of you have probably seen or heard of uh, vape shops. This is a, a sign, a picture of vape on the water, a very clever sign that my colleague, Dr. Slattery, took on the way to the lake. Um, but 
I think that while the vape shops are something that you know many people have noticed and pay attention to, the concerning thing is that electronic cigarettes are sold everywhere, in convenience stores, drug stores, gas stations, retail outlets. For some of you who have been to the Galleria Mall in Birmingham, there's a mall kiosk that sells electronic cigarettes in grocery stores, and one of the places in particular where there's the potential for abuse is on the internet. So if you go to the blue website, there's an initial screen that says if you're not 18, don't keep going. But there's no enforcement for somebody to not continue on that screen and order, as you can see here, your Java Jolt, your Vivid Vanilla. Uh, these are things that have, the internet is, is a place where there is a loophole in terms of um, youth in particular being able to buy, purchase um, many varieties of electronic cigarettes. In Alabama, the age of purchase of all tobacco products is 19. So what is the, um, the result? of electronic cigarettes being so ubiquitous, so easy for our youth to get. Well, the positive thing in terms of tobacco control in our country is over the past 50 years, we've seen some great decrease in tobacco use from 40% of adults using tobacco to now about 17 to 18% nationally, and that number is higher, unfortunately, in Alabama. But over the past few years, particularly in youth, we have not seen a decrease in youth tobacco use. And that's what you see in those bars on the far left of uh, the slide. Uh, that compares 2011, 2012, 2013 to 2014. And you can see in, when we look at all tobacco use that that number is about the same. 25% for high school students on the National Youth Tobacco Survey, uh, which is a survey that's given every year to middle and high school students. And so about one in four of our high school students nationally are have ever tried a tobacco product. One in four. And so part of this, um, this uh, unchange in tobacco use is related with electronic cigarette use. So you can see the red box around electronic cigarettes and just the huge astronomical increase between the years of 2011 and 2014. And you can see right next door, hookah sees a, a similar type of increase. And then when you continue, the next, um, the next line over is, is cigarettes. And you can see, which is a po very positive thing, that the use of high school students over 2011 to 2014 has dropped. However, when we look at tobacco as a whole, with the large increase in electronic cigarettes in particular, we haven't seen that change that we'd like to in terms of tobacco use. So we'll look at this data, uh, drill down on this data just a little bit more. So among middle and high school students with the same National Youth Tobacco Survey, when we look at not just ever use, whether anyone has ever tried, but current use, which is de de defined as the past 30 days, so have you used a tobacco product within the past month, on the National Youth Tobacco Survey in 2014, that number was 13.4%. And percentages sometimes are hard to kind of wrap your head around, but that is 2 million of our students using electronic cigarettes. In 2013, that number was 4.5%. So again, we're seeing just this huge increase every year. Um, and fortunately, the preliminary data shows that we may be starting to flatline. Hopefully our message is getting out that electronic cigarettes are not safe for our youth. But again, a huge increase just over the past four years. So looking at 2013 data, 6.1% uh, of youth over grades 6 through 12 had ever tried an electronic cigarette. And again, just to reemphasize how much this has increased just over the past few years, that's gone up three times from 2011. And we'll start getting into a little bit of which groups are using electronic cigarettes. When we look at um, by whether somebody has ever tried cigarettes or they've never tried cigarettes, you see a very large difference. <coughs> Excuse me. Where 20% 
of youth, uh, grades 6 through 12, who have ever used a cigarette have used electronic cigarettes, whereas youth that have never smoked a cigarette, only 0.9%, about 1%. So this is uh, a survey from Legacy, which is now known as the Truth Initiative, in 2014. And this is getting to those uh, differences a little bit more. So on the far left, you're seeing all youth and what the rate of ever use. So remember, that's anyone ever just trying electronic cigarette. And you see among our age 13 through 17, 14%. But then when you look at the older teenagers and the young adults, that rate goes up to 39%. Uh, when you look at people who have ever used cigarettes, ever tried a cigarette, that number jumps to 53% for our 13 to 17 year olds and 68% among that young adult and uh, older teenager, 18 to 21%. Very similar numbers among uh, our youth who are current cigarette smokers, so who have used cigarettes over the past month. And again, you know, 59% among the younger age group, and then 76% among our older teenagers and young adults. So this is uh, very similar data when we talk about who, who's currently using. So these numbers are a little bit lower because they're in the past month. But just to draw your attention on the right-hand side, among current cigarette smokers, 50% of our young teenagers, 13 to 17 years of age, are also currently, within the past month, using electronic cigarettes. And then among young adults and teenagers, 65%. So the majority who are using cigarettes are also using electronic cigarettes, and we call this dual use. So um, this is another survey called Monitoring the Future from 2014. And what I want to call your attention to in this slide is that this is comparing the current use of cigarettes versus electronic cigarettes. And in 2014, for the first time in this survey, as well as the National Youth Tobacco Survey that I mentioned previously, youth are using electronic cigarettes more commonly than they're using any other tobacco product, including cigarettes. And so while we are certainly very pleased that the rate of cigarette use is going down, because as I mentioned, cigarettes are one of the most lethal products that is known, um, we don't want electronic cigarettes to be replacing this. And adult electronic cigarette use, when we think about our youth being exposed to uh, the messaging and also the electronic cigarette aerosol, the adult cigarette use, electronic cigarette use, is mirroring um, the youth use, that it's, uh, that it's really exploded over the past few years. Uh, so much so that in that young adult age group, 18 to 44, you know, there are rates of uh, 14, 8 to 14 percent among current adults. So why are we concerned that so many youth, so many adults are now trying and using electronic cigarettes? Well, in order to, the, to answer that question, we want to get into what is in the electronic cigarette solution. I have in front of me several examples of electronic cigarette solutions, and these are things that you can buy to refill the cartridge in your electronic cigarette. So the things that we know that are advertised in electronic cigarettes are humectants, uh, which are basically moisturizers like uh, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, flavoring, and nicotine. Uh, there are electronic cigarette solutions that advertise that they do not contain nicotine. And um, Dr. Slattery is going to be talking about this a little bit more, but when we do quantitative surveys, it's found that without regulation, there are solutions that say they have no nicotine in it, but have been found to have nicotine. So we know what's advertised in these electronic cigarette solutions, but what has actually been found in the solutions? Well, not only those ingredients that I just mentioned, but in addition, there's been toxicants, carcinogens, metallic nanoparticles. And so when I mentioned the atomizer that heats up the electronic cigarette solution, that atomizer is made of metal, and over time with heating, it can degrade, and that's what forms those metallic nanoparticles. So here's a picture, actually, that came from a colleague, Dr. Sue Tansky, and in her 
uh, adventure to a vape shop, you can see all the different bottles um, that were available. And I think of it kind of like a yogurt bar where you go in and it's like a choose your own adventure. You can ask for strawberry pancake and uh, the storekeeper will mix up different bottles. And um, it's difficult to see, but the bottles also contain a number on them. Uh, for example, on the middle top shelf, it says cigar, 18 milligrams. And when my colleague asked the storekeeper, you know, what does 18 milligrams mean? Uh, you know, is that a concentration? She was told that they thought that it meant 18 milligrams of nicotine per puff, which we'll learn later that would certainly be what's considered within a very toxic or lethal dose. So the, uh, the point really of this is that at this point, there's no regulation in terms of you know, what a vape shop can offer, what they can say they have in their ingredients. You know, I can go into my own garage tonight and mix up some solution and sell it as electronic cigarette solution, simply because there's no regulation at this point. So in order to talk a little bit more about the ingredients, I think it's important for everyone to understand what this generally recognized as safe classification means. And because many of the ingredients, um, particularly the humectants, and the flavorings are considered generally recognized as safe. But this classification applies for food, not, <clears throat> sorry, inhalation. And so it's based on scientific evidence or if it's a substance that's been used for decades uh, through experience and that there's a substantial history of consumption for food, again, for ingestion, not inhalation. There are some exclusions made for certain things. So propylene glycol, again, is one of the humectants used in electronic cigarette solution. And that's excluded from cat food due to a certain type of anemia related with cats. And then, um, you know, propylene glycol generally recognizes safe, but there really has been very few human studies for inhalation. It has been used as a tobacco humectant historically, but we do know it can cause eye and respiratory irritation. Um, there is a uh, statement from Dow Chemical saying that inhalation exposure to propylene glycol should be avoided. Uh, so simply, we just don't know the long-term implications of repeated inhalation to propylene glycol. <clears throat> the other humectant that we know is oftentimes in electronic cigarette solution is vegetable glycerin. Again, this is generally recognized as safe. However, when heated and vaporized, it can form acrolein, which can cause upper respiratory irritation. So again, unknown in terms of the long-term health impacts from repeated inhalation for some of the, for the ingredients, the humectants, that we know are in electronic cigarettes. So moving on to the flavorings. Um, the flavorings, again, have not been assessed for safety as inhalants. Generally, they are recognized as safe. The American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association does have some restrictions. They don't allow uh, diacetyl, whole tobacco alkaloids, medicinals, illegal or controlled substances, caffeine, vitamins, and artificial food coloring. But flavors are known to be appealing to youth. So in my field trip to a vape shop, you know, I picked up a vape shop and actually my local uh, drugstore. You know, if you like sour Skittles, you know, there's a sour Skittle electronic cigarette solution. If you like peaches, you can get a peach electronic cigarette solution. Uh, Death by Chocolate is also available. So there are thousands of flavors that are known. And we know that flavors are very appealing to youth and adults, and that's why they've been banned from conventional cigarettes for decades now. So this is just a picture, again, from a vape shop where you see the variety, and this is just a small, small um, uh, sample of what the different varieties of flavor. Uh, you can see in that top left corner uh, the, party or the party animal, and then there's orange creamsicle. So these are flavors that you know, generally are very appealing to children. So, and then nicotine, um, talking about the electronic cigarette solution ingredients that are advertised. Uh, as I mentioned, there are solutions that claim that they have no nicotine, 
but in some quantitative studies have been found to contain nicotine. Uh, so just a brief um, summary of nicotine, because Dr. Slattery is going to be talking about that a lot more in the second hour. Nicotine is considered a poison and a toxin. It is uh, seen in things called, uh, like rat poison. And it is currently only commercially available from the tobacco plant. So any electronic cigarette solution that contains nicotine is considered a tobacco product. So I think that this points out uh, this sample from a um, disposable electronic cigarette that was purchased by myself at a gas station, you know, not even a mile from our public high school. You know, it says that it contains nicotine, 2.4 percent, which would be 24 milligrams per cc, but then it says no tobacco. So this just points out that, you know, in this unregulated environment, you know, people can advertise or say whatever they want because there's no oversight into this. So nicotine is a primary psychoactive ingredient in tobacco. It's what makes tobacco products addictive. Uh, again, this is kind of the same theme of choose your own adventure. Choose, um, you know, a electronic cigarette, um, a flavor that you like, and they had plastic mouthpieces that you could try these different flavors before you commit to actually buying your own. So let's get into some of the ingredients that we know that have been found in scientific studies to be present in the electronic cigarette solution and the aerosol that are not advertised. So what you see in front of you is a table with some of the toxic compounds uh, that are to toxicants or carcinogens like formaldehyde, acetylaldehyde, acrolein, toluene, NNN and NNK, which are tobacco-specific nitrosamines and are carcinogens, cancer-causing agents. And what this table shows is the component, the compounds that are that are available in that are in conventional cigarettes. So again, we know, and I think most of uh, even smokers know that smoking cigarettes is not safe, is not healthy. But when you look at those same exact compounds uh, with electronic cigarettes, we find that those same compounds are present in electronic cigarettes. The formaldehyde, the acetylaldehyde, acrolein, toluene, and the tobacco-specific nitrosamines. They are present at lower levels, but for our youth and for our own health, we want, to, we want clean air, not this is just better than conventional cigarettes. So again, same toxic substances found in conventional cigarettes are found in electronic cigarettes. So let's get to the non-users and what the health harms are to non-users. The picture that you see in front of you is an advertisement uh, for electronic cigarettes, which of course are not geared towards children. Uh, they're, they look like crayons, they're in a Crayola box. And this is kind of some of the advertising that we're seeing on the internet, you know, on TV, you know, in, uh, in advertisements. So some of you may have heard uh, different advertisements about, you know, oh, it's just harmless water vapor. There's nothing to worry about. Well, we have enough scientific evidence to know that that is not true. Um, we know that secondhand aerosol from the electronic cigarettes emit variable levels of nicotine. They are at lower levels than conventional cigarettes, but they're certainly still present. And that they emit fine particles of similar size to what you would see with conventional cigarettes and comparable concentrations. And so I know that the uh, graphs on the slide are a little bit difficult to see, but the take home point is that the bottom is what you might see uh, in terms of fine particles with conventional cigarettes, and the top graph uh, is what you would see with an electronic cigarette. So very similar in terms of the pattern of uh, fine particles. Um, we also know that there's low levels of other toxins, the same old formaldehyde, acetylaldehyde that I've already mentioned, as well as those nanoparticles, uh, nanometallic particles that I mentioned. So this is a similar table. Again, I know a little bit difficult to see, but the take home point is that when we think about secondhand aerosol from electronic cigarette, we have some of the same 
toxic, same carcinogens that you would see with a conventional cigarette. So you see the listing of different compounds, and the red box is, a, uh, is, is conventional cigarettes, and you see the different concentrations. And then now you see the different concentrations of those same compounds in electronic cigarettes. Again, those levels are lower, but they're not zero. It's not har harmless water vapor, and we want to make sure that we keep our eyes on the ball, that for ourselves and for our children, we want the gold standard to be clean air, not just it's better than cigarettes. So what are the harms to our children? As a pediatrician, this is something very near and dear to me. And when we, um, you know, as a hospitalist who sees children day in and day out who have asthma, a bronchiolitis, which is a lower airways disease that affects mainly infants, uh, ear infections, pneumonias, you know, these are things that are either caused or worsened by tobacco smoke. And this, with electronic cigarettes, I certainly don't want this to be an issue that now we're seeing children with the same type of health uh, ha harms based on electronic cigarettes, secondhand or thirdhand aerosol. So, of course, it's not ethical to do studies of children where we expose them to something that we know is harmful. Uh, but there are mouse models, and what you see in front of you is uh, in a study where they took neonatal mice, newborn mice, and the mice were exposed to just the admissions uh, from a lower level nicotine solution twice a day for 10 days. There was elevated blood levels of nicotine just after 10 days of having that exposure. So that's that, uh, the highest bar, that 1.8% nicotine that you see in the uh, graph in front of you. So, and then when they look at pathologic samples of the lungs of all of those mice, what they see is impaired alveolar growth. So they see impaired growth of the lungs in those newborn mice, particularly who were exposed to electronic cigarette emissions, and more so with the higher nicotine solution. So you saw those pathologic samples. This is a different way of looking at it where they can quantify by number. And on the far right-hand side is where you can see higher is worse in this table, that the alveolar growth is impaired in these newborn mice that were exposed to electronic cigarette emissions. So of course, this makes us very concerned when we're thinking about the unborn child, when we're thinking about the newborn uh, you know, baby that might be exposed to electronic cigarettes particularly if a parent doesn't even realize if that might harm their child. So you can also uh, 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 detect lung function. You can also test lung function in these same newborn mice. And so this is the graph that you see here, that in this graph, lower is worse, and that when you're looking at uh, the newborn mice lung function in that 1.8% nicotine, you see that the lung function has been impaired. So uh, we saw a study related with mice that were exposed to electronic cigarette emissions and the effect that they had on the lungs. And so there's another study with a very similar model where the mice were exposed to emissions, again, uh, twice a day for about two weeks and what the effect was on their immune system. And I'm not going to go through this entire slide, but the important takeaway is that after this, this exposure, uh, we see that these neonatal, these mice were not able to mount the same immune response that the mice who did not have that exposure um, were able to mount. So again, you know, very concerning. These are mice models, but very concerning for what electronic cigarette emissions might be doing in terms of the health of our young children. And we know cigarette smoke, conventional cigarette smoke, impairs your immune system, actually makes you more likely to have autoimmune diseases. So this is something that is, there's definitely more scientific evidence and studies that are needed, but very concerning information. So how about third-hand aerosol? That's a newer term where it basically means that after the electronic cigarette is, uh, is after the 
uh, electronic cigarette has no longer uh, been vaping and what is left on surfaces. So we do know that nicotine does collect on surfaces after the electronic cigarette has been used. And with third hand, um, uh, third hand smoke exposure uh, from conventional cigarettes, we know that this nicotine can combine with indoor substances such as ozone, nitrous oxide, and that can make irritants and carcinogens. So this is a, a graph, uh, a, a bar graph, that shows the nicotine uh, deposited on different substances in this experiment, from the vinyl wall, and then you can see that the tile floor had the most um, third hand or the most nicotine deposits. And when you think about, you know, who's going to be closest to that tile floor? Well, that's going to be your toddler that's crawling on the floor, or your infant. And that's really what the concern is with third hand aerosol. So in summary of the health harms, um, as I mentioned, safety of electronic cigarette liquid components when heated and inhaled, at this point we do have some evidence that there's concerns but it's largely unknown when we're talking about the flavoring and when we're talking about the propylene glycol and the vegetable glycerin. We do know that toxicants, including nicotine and carcinogens, are found in these electronic cigarette solutions and the secondhand and thirdhand aerosol. And there's growing concern for health effects for youth with decreased lung function and immune function. And as I mentioned, this industry at this point is unregulated. So we don't know, you know, what is being advertised is what you're getting. Most of these products are being made in China, and without oversight, you just don't know what you're getting. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about public health. And I love this slide because I think it just illustrates so perfectly who electronic cigarettes are being targeted. Not to middle-aged women like myself, but we're talking about our youth, our youth, you know, men in this case. So this was a Sports Illustrated advertisement uh, for blue cigarettes, and these advertisements are pretty ubiquitous. We know that over 80% of our uh, older teenagers have been exposed to an electronic cigarette te television advertisement. So what are the public health concerns? Uh, one of the major concerns is that there's the potential to glamorize and renormalize smoking. Television advertisements for conventional cigarettes have been banned for decades. And so electronic cigarettes being on television is the first tobacco product that most of our youth have been exposed to. We know that nicotine uh, is an addictive substance, so we are certainly concerned about the addiction potential for our youth, for non-smokers. We also are very concerned that non-smokers and former smokers, people who have put away conventional cigarettes, may think, well, you know, that says that electronic cigarettes are healthy and safe, so I'm just going to restart use, you know, vaping rather than using the conventional cigarettes, and that these former smokers or non-smokers can also become addicted. Uh, the concern as well is that electronic cigarettes are not approved as a smoking cessation device and have been advertised uh, or with subtle or explicit messages that they are a smoking cessation device. And then we mentioned dual use, but that oftentimes what we're seeing and the evidence shows that even when people are using an electronic cigarette with the goal of smoking cessation that generally what's happening is they're using both. They're not quitting their conventional cigarette but they're using their electronic cigarette perhaps in places where they might not be able to smoke like their workplace, like the mall, uh, like a restaurant and they're using their electronic cigarette there but they haven't quit the conventional cigarette. So renormalizing smoking, we, we already touched on this, but at this point, you know, when we have a comprehensive smoke-free ban on a workplace or in a restaurant, these do not automatically cover electronic cigarettes. So that's something that we'll talk about a little bit more. And so unless a workplace or a restaurant specifically bans the electronic cigarette, um, at this point, people oftentimes are led to believe that they can use an electronic cigarette, you know, wherever they want. Uh, we already mentioned advertising, 
And, you know, TV advertisements for conventional cigarettes, again, have long been banned. Um, and in general, you saw this picture already, but to a bypasser, especially to a youth, they're largely indistinguishable from a cigarette. So we have a commercial that I want to show everyone to just kind of see some of the marketing that some of our youth are being exposed to. I want you to get it out. I want to see it, feel it, hold it, put it in my mouth. I want to see how great it tastes. If you're going to vape, vape with VIP. Do you want to see it? I can get it out, if you like. You can feel it, hold it, put it in your mouth, and see how great it tastes. If you're going to vape, vape with VIP. So you can see that that commercial is in no way subtle. You know, sex sells and conventional cigarettes, um, again, have been banned. But this, these were the type of advertisements that were, you know, on television, uh, you know, decades ago. And electronic cigarettes are using a lot of those same tactics. So moving on to nicotine's addiction potential. Um, we do know, and those of you with teenagers know, that teenagers are not mature. Uh, the adolescent brain is known to be susceptible, much more susceptible, to becoming addicted than if, you know, an adult was to pick up an electronic cigarette that contained nicotine uh, containing solution. So even with, uh, you know, experimental use, adolescents are more likely to become addicted. Animal sh studies show that nicotine exposure in those teenage years can have long-standing effects in the brain that include cell damage that might lead to, lead to persistent behavior changes. And I think many of you have heard of the gateway theory where use of nicotine might lead to other drugs of abuse, uh, specifically cocaine, but other drugs uh, like heroin and uh, psychoactive uh, substances. So the addiction potential of the electronic cigarette solutions that contain nicotine are of uh, very great concern to us as, a medical um, us as a medical community. And we do know that never smoking youth, so youth that have never smoked a cigarette but then use an electronic cigarette were more likely, and in this study, 2.3 times more likely, to be smoking cigarettes or other combustible tobacco products like cigars, like cigarillos a year later. And you know, this is just preliminary data at this point. But the concern certainly is that you know the message has gotten out there that conventional cigarettes um, is are bad. You know, that doesn't mean that people aren't still smoking. It doesn't mean that our youth aren't still experimenting with it. But What's happening now with electronic cigarettes is that we're seeing youth and teenagers that who that may never try an electronic cigarette, or sorry, who may never want to do an, a conventional cigarette, that are using electronic cigarettes and sort of that gateway theory where they're using electronic cigarettes, and then that makes it easier for them to transition to the conventional cigarette. So this is basically the uh, study that I just mentioned. And when the major thing to pay attention to is that top line where it says any combustible tobacco product, uh, this study had about 2,500 youth and young adults that they followed for 12 months. And when you compare the second column where it says never use of e-cigarettes, and um, in that study, 9.3% of a youth that had never used electronic cigarettes went on to use a combustible tobacco product like cigarettes. But when you look at they ever use electronic cigarettes, 25 percent of those youth went on to do a combustible tobacco product. So again, you know, the take home point is that use of an electronic cigarette is, we're concerned that this might be sort of a gateway into doing the conventional cigarettes, which we all know are very harmful for, for, for their health. In this study, they also found a reverse effect, 
with children who were smoking conventional cigarettes were also more likely to use electronic cigarettes. And that, that kind of makes sense. So then going to the next topic, is there evidence that electronic cigarettes helps people quit smoking traditional cigarettes? You know, I think as healthcare providers, we all want to help our patients, help our patients' parents quit smoking this habit uh, so they're more healthy, their kids aren't exposed to secondhand smoke. But what we see, and again, you know, this evidence is newer. You know, we've had decades to study conventional cigarettes, but only really a few years to be able to study electronic cigarettes. But in this meta-analysis by Glantz, smokers who use electronic cigarettes were about 30% less likely to quit conventional cigarettes. So what we're saying is that electronic cigarettes have, are not, at this point, uh, a smoking cessation device with any evidence and uh, like I mentioned they're not FDA approved to be a smoking cessation device. So again you know most smokers that use electronic cigarettes uh, to quit smoking end up becoming what we call a dual user. They use both conventional cigarettes and the electronic cigarettes but we do want to continue studying this um, and helping our smokers um, who want to quit smoking. So, you know, after all this information, I think it's pretty clear that we need regulation. Um, the expectations are that the market will continue to explode. Currently, it's a billion, with a B, billion dollar industry. And right now, anyone can manufacture and sell. Um, there are quality control issues. You know, of course, like I just mentioned, that, you know, you buy a solution of e-liquid, that says there's zero percent nicotine. You know, most of the time, we feel like if we buy something that advertises X, that that's what we're going to get is X. And that's not the case with electronic cigarette solutions. Uh, so most of the market, as I mentioned, comes from China. Um, actually, one of the products that I purchased says uh, something to the effect of this is a, a proud United States um, a product and then it said made in China. So, you know, you got to read the fine print. Um, and so one of the things that I think has been really concern, concerning to tobacco control experts that all the major tobacco companies now have their own brand of electronic cigarettes. Uh, Lorelide has blue cigarettes, as we've already mentioned, is, is probably the one with the most advertising money behind it at this point. This is a, a blue cigarette that I bought for $10.99 at the local drug store that is Cherry Crush and 2.4% nicotine. Reynolds has Views and Altria has Mark 10. So there is millions and millions of dollars that are being spent to advertise these electronic cigarettes and tobacco companies spend about a million dollars an hour, every hour, to advertise and um, uh, give coupons, product placement uh, for uh, conventional cigarettes. And so they know how to advertise to our youth. So uh, in terms of market share, as I mentioned, this is a billion dollars with a B. And what some experts rec uh, actually think is that eventually electronic cigarettes could even surpass the conventional or traditional cigarettes, you know, when we look out to even 2023. So the red box is around, is around 2015, and you can see an, under the second um, major area, electronic cigarette revenue for Altria, Lorelog, and Reynolds. Um, at that point, uh, it's about $0.8 billion, and that's expected to just keep growing because uh, often, so oftentimes what we're seeing is that uh, electronic cigarette companies start out small, then they're bought by a larger company like some of these tobacco companies. So the, uh, the Food and Drug Administration has issued a deeming document. So currently they do have jurisdiction over tobacco products, but not over some of the emerging products like electronic cigarettes, uh, cigars, um, and so they issued in 2014 a document that would give them jurisdiction, and we're expecting that to hopefully um, happen in this, in this summer of 2016. What that will do is it will give the Food and Drug Administration uh, the authority to uh, have quality standards 
quality control production standards uh, to be able to say that you cannot sell to children less than 18 years of age that just like conventional cigarettes now that have the health warning labels that that can be regulated on electronic cigarettes that you can't sell electronic cigarettes in vending machines and that they can't falsely market things are healthy or they're safe or they don't contain tobacco but the final rule hasn't come and you know even if it happened tomorrow it wouldn't take effect until two years after the final rule and unfortunately it will miss things like the flavors as we've talked about which is so appealing to youth childproof packaging marketing and online sales so again we're hoping that this might be something that happens in the, this summer summer of 2016 but it will it does miss uh, some very key features that uh, tobacco control experts feel are very important when we talk about electronic cigarettes and child safety. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, like many other organizations, have published a policy statement on the uh, recommendations that they feel for clinicians and also for public health. And as I mentioned, electronic nicotine delivery systems is uh, the terminology that the American Academy of Pediatrics and oftentimes when you see the published literature will use. But their recommendations are that we want to reduce youth access to and demand for electronic cigarettes. So that has to do with, you know, internet sales, flavoring. We want to eliminate exposure to electronic cigarette aerosol and the solution, which can be a, it is a poisoning risk. And we'll talk a little bit about comprehensive smoke-free policies and the need for electronic cigarettes to be included in those. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that the purchase age of all tobacco products is 21 years of age, including electronic cigarettes. And we recommend, like conventional cigarettes, where all flavors, other than menthol, are prohibited, that the flavors are also prohibited in electronic cigarettes. We also, the American Academy of Pediatrics also recommends that we limit advertising and media depictions because we know in particularly adults and youth, but particularly youth are very sensitive to point of sale advertisements. Like when you go into a gas station, you see, you know, a big advertisement right in front of you, but also on the TV in uh, magazines that they might be looking at and that we tax electronic cigarettes and the solution similar to other tobacco products. And that's currently not done at the federal level. So just as a reminder, I wanted to show uh, what the age of tobacco purchase was in the United States. Alabama, like four other states, uh, is included in four other states that prohibit tobacco purchase until age 19. So very proud of Alabama to say that we have a higher age of purchase. Um, and Hawaii, just this past year, or in 2015, uh, approved legislation that prohibits tobacco purchase until the age of 21. So that was very exciting. And hopefully we'll see in that state that the dynamics of youth using tobacco and hopefully adults using tobacco is going to change over the next few years. There are other uh, counties or uh, municipalities, uh, particularly in the Northeast, which have also uh, prohibited tobacco purchase until 21 years of age. So then looking at electronic cigarette laws, uh, what you see in the blue is that these are the states that prohibit sale of electronic cigarettes to minors under age 18. And actually in the state of Alabama, as I mentioned, tobacco products, the sale is 19. Uh, in the green is electronic um, that, in the green where Maine is, that they include electronic cigarettes in their state clean air, indoor air law. And many of you probably know that Alabama does not have a state clean indoor air law, the comprehensive smoke-free policies by in the entire state of Alabama. And only about 12% of Alabama citizens are covered by comprehensive smoke-free policies. In the orange, we see where the states that prohibit the sale of electronic cigarettes to minors but also includes electronic cigarettes in their state clean indoor air law. So that's uh, about five states that uh, include electronic cigarettes in their state clean indoor air law. 
And then lastly, child-resistant packaging. And, um, you know, sadly, there's already been one child death from ingestion of nicotine-containing electronic cigarette solution. And so this is something that formally the states were um, individually requiring this child-resistant packaging. But I'm very pleased to say that the Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act was signed by President Obama in January of 2016. And what that does is it requires liquid nicotine refills to have child-resistant packaging. So as I, I keep pointing out, you know, this uh, electronic cigarette solution is easily open, smells fantastic. You know, you would want to just drink the whole thing. And so this is this um, uh, Prevention Act is going to require that e-cigarette uh, vendors put these in child-resistant packaging. And it's going to be enforced by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, and enforcement is going to begin this summer. So let's get down to what you who are watching can do in your clinical practice. So I know a lot of you are frontline staff, just like I am, dealing with things every day. It's hard to incorporate something new in your practice. But what the recommendations are is that when you're screening children for uh, tobacco use and exposure, you know, in your well child check, or in the case of somebody who comes to your office with an asthma attack or pneumonia or recurrent ear infections, that you also screen them for electronic cigarette use. So you'd want to ask that same, in that same question, you know, are there caretakers who smoke that take care of your child? Um, and because that may not be a parent, it may be a grandparent, it may be a babysitter. So in that same question, you want to ask about electronic cigarette use. And particularly, as I already gave you the data, that children are using electronic cigarettes more than they're using uh, conventional cigarettes now. When you're talking to your you know, teenagers, you know, middle school and higher, you want to ask, are you, you know, using cigarettes? Are you using vape pens? Uh, you know, of course, because they may not uh, use the same electronic nicotine delivery system, you know, terminology that you're asking. So you want to ask them things that they would understand in the terminology that they're using. So you want to screen children and adults for cigarette use and exposure. But we also want to be counseling children, not only about the harm specifically about tobacco products, but also electronic cigarettes, because we know that they're getting lots and lots of messages uh, from celebrities on you know, TV, the media, that this is okay, this is healthy. We want to tell them it's not. And, then, and we know that teenagers, as much as we think they don't, they do listen to us as doctors, nurses, healthcare providers. We also want to counsel parents and other caretakers not to use electronic cigarettes or other tobacco products. And if they are going to use them, we want to advocate for smoke-free home and vehicle bans. For youth and our parents who do use electronic cigarettes or other tobacco products like cigarettes, we want to offer or recommend the t tobacco dependence treatment. And there are lots of free, um, very easily accessible uh, resources uh, for your patients and for you to help your patients. Uh, one of the best ones is the 1-800-QUIT-NOW line, which offers eight weeks of free nicotine patches in the state of Alabama. Uh, otherwise, we want to recommend that electronic cigarette liquid is stored as a medication. So that means out of reach of children, high, um, you know, top drawer, in a lock cabinet, and then in child-resistant packaging. Because even though we know that the, uh, the, the child-resistant, the Act, uh, Prevention Act, is going to require that child-resistant packaging starts this summer, you know, if you have a, you know, bottle that you bought previously, you're using, that your children can still get into that. And then we do not, as healthcare providers, want to recommend electronic cigarettes for smoking cessation. We want to recommend FDA-approved, evidence-based uh, nicotine replacement therapy and other um, nicotine and other behavioral counseling that we know is effective for smoking cessation. Uh, so as a healthcare provider, I think it's important uh, when the opportunity comes to advocate for comprehensive smoke-free policies in your organization, whether you're at a clinic or a hospital, and in your community. And we want to make sure that they include electronic cigarettes. 
Uh, we want to advocate for policies in general that reduce youth demand for electronic cigarettes. So as I've already touched on many times, you know, these sour Skittle flavors are very appealing to youth. So we want to ban flavors in electronic cigarette solutions. Uh, again, we talked about the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation that the age of purchase for all tobacco products be 21 years of age. And we've already talked about how easy it is at this point for you to buy tobacco, uh, to buy the electronic cigarettes on the internet. So we're going to close with this final slide, and this is a vape shop that I went to uh, on my field trip. Uh, this is right outside of Birmingham. And this is just an example of the wide variety of just some of the products, the electronic uh, cigarettes, uh, the larger uh, vape pens and mechanical mods and tanks that are available. So I appreciate your time. And at this point, we're going to take a break. And the second half of the hour, we're going to have Dr. Slattery. Welcome back to Smoke and Mirrors, Electronic Cigarettes and Child Health. Our next presenter is Dr. Ann Slattery from the Regional Poison Control Center at Children's of Alabama. Hi. I'm going to talk um, about no vaping in the boys' room. And the reason I chose this title is the majority of the data that I'm going to present is going to be about children uh, less than or equal to 19 years of age. My goal is to look at national statistics of e-cigarette liquid exposures as reported to poison control centers in the United States from the year 2010 through 2015. I'm also going to look at regional data, just Alabama, um, e-cigarette liquid exposures as reported to the regional poison control center, Children's of Alabama. Now, I have data from 2010 through April the 16th. 2016, so just, you know, a little over two weeks ago. We're also going to look at toxicity, uh, the range of toxicity when a poison center might refer a person into a health care facility, also what possibly could be a potentially lethal dose. We're also going to look at signs and symptoms. Um, the data comes from the National Poison Data System, and from here on out, I'm going to call it NPDS. This is the database from the American Association of Poison Control Centers. Every eight seconds, a phone will ring in a poison center, and every 14 seconds, it will be an exposure. So an RN or a pharmacist who answers the phone in one of these 55 poison centers will take the call and once it has been documented it goes to NPDS in less than eight minutes. Almost three million calls a year go into NPDS and approximately 2.2 million are going to be human exposures. Currently there are over 63 million cases electronically held in NPDS since 1983. One disclaimer, um, all NPS, NPDS data does not necessarily represent a complete picture because all of these calls are voluntary. So it is voluntary for the physician in an ED to call. It is voluntary for a parent or a victim to call after being exposed to a substance. So this is not a complete picture. Also, because I have data from 2015 that I specifically requested from the AAPCC, this database does not become closed until this summer, and it will not be published until 2015. So there is a slight, small chance that some of the data may change, like if there was a case in December and the outcome changed because they've been in the hospital for a long time, 
that kind of thing could happen. But most of the data that you will see will be current and what you would expect by the end of the year. First, we're going to look at MPDS All Ages. Now, this data you see in front of you is on their website. This is not something I specifically requested. And I put the website up there for you. And it is data that actually goes into 2016, and it ends March the 31st. And it just shows you the exposure calls that have come from the 55 poison centers um, and that have been entered into MPDS. And we see um, how it slowly increased from 2011. It looks like uh, our tallest amount is in 2014. And here, this is over 9,600 calls right here that poison centers have received since 2011. Now, this is MPDS, and this is data only about those less than or equal to 19 years of age. As you can see, 2014 to 2015, the number does not drop. It is increasing. Um, you'll also see some 2010 data that you didn't see previously, and that is because the numbers were very small, and it's not on their website. And also, the product code that enables poison centers to track um, e-cigarette liquid exposures was invented in 2010. There was no code prior to that. So once that code became available, then we were able to actually track. And if you'll see, this is a little over uh, 6,600 exposures in the less than equal to 19 years of age. And this is basically, um, oh, I'd say, 70% of the exposures that we saw on the previous slide. Okay. Now, this is uh, MPDS data. And this actually broke it down by year. And this is, again, 2010 through 2015. And you will see that the majority of the cases are going to be in those less than five years of age, with our peak groups being one and two. Now, it is all ages. And so we are seeing exposures, you know, all the way up into 19. Now we're going to look at Alabama regional data. And this is all ages. We've had 263 calls about exposures to the e-cigarette liquids um, from 2010. And this data is through April the 16th of this year. And it just shows you, and again, we're seeing a decrease as we are seeing nationally. Now we're going to look at it by age for those less than or equal to 19 years of age. And again, the majority are going to be less than five years of age. I do want to tell you something about some of these cases. Uh, like one teenager, he drank it on a dare. So it's not all people that are smoking it or who accidentally ingest it because they get a hold of the container. Now, when you're looking at the one and the two-year-olds, they are sometimes actually picking up the vape pen and taking a vape. Some of them are actually opening up the container and taking a sip. Then we have some of these really young kids, because in the national data, there were children as, as young as eight days old that were being exposed, where older siblings were getting the product and taking it into the crib and squirting it on them. So they're all different types of exposures. They, these are not all ingestions. When we talk about nicotine toxicity, there is so much to discuss in this area. I could take a whole hour, but I won't. Um, when you talk about nicotine toxicity, are we talking about the amount that a poison center would refer in, or are we talking about the amount that would be potentially lethal? So we're going to look at both of those. But there are many things to consider. First, you have to consider the route of exposure. How are these people being exposed? And how much could be absorbed? You have to look at the pH of the product. Um, you have to look at the bioavailability of the product. You also have to look at the fact a lot of these studies, the dose is presumed. Like we like to say in the poison world, 
if it was witnessed, it wouldn't have happened. Because hopefully, if a parent witnessed a child getting into something, they could have stopped it. So a lot of times, we don't know exactly how much was ingested or how much they were exposed to. And without serum levels, we really can't tell. So with all that being said, we'll now talk about nicotine toxicity. It's pretty much accepted that two to five milligrams will cause nausea, but there is a case report where a two milligram dose in a small child ended up in severe toxicity. It is pretty much accepted also in the poison world that the lethal dose is around one milligram per kilogram. But if we received a call where our child was exposed to that amount, we would not be watching them at home if they were even close to that amount. We give ourselves, you know, room for error. So one milligram per kilogram would be about 10 milligrams in a child or 30 to 60 milligrams in an adult. Now there is one reference that is used and it's very popular that states and it looks at uh, tobacco um, and the gum and the patches and it states 1.4 to 1.9 milligrams per kilogram will result in severe toxicity. And it's pretty much generally accepted that 40 to 60 milligrams in an adult is potentially lethal. Now, the toxic dose that we would refer to an emergency department, this is if a child were to swallow one of the following. Before I go over this, let me just, uh, for those that don't know, if you smoke a cigarette, 70% of it goes off into smoke, and about 20% goes into the filter or the butt. Um, and then only 10% do you actually intake. So um, a person smoking a cigarette is usually only going to get one to two milligrams per cigarette. So if a child were to ingest one cigarette and were able to retain it, that would be a life-threatening dose. So if we have a parent call and a child's ingested a cigarette, they would be referred in. If they got three cigarette butts, because about 20% of the nicotine goes in there, they would be referred in. When it comes to those transdermal skin patches, they have reservoirs and they have such greater concentrations. And if they were to be chewed, just chewing it and getting it absorbed through the mouth could be potentially very toxic. So any exposure to a patch in the oral cavity in a child is going to be referred to an emergency department. And then a lick from one of those refill bottles, uh, e-liquids, Depending on the concentration, a lick, if it were a 50% concentration, could be enough to be potentially toxic. Now, on this slide, you're looking at a 30 ml bottle. And let's say this 30 ml bottle of your e-cigarette nicotine liquid is the 1.8 to 2.4 um, percent, which means it's 18 to 24 milligrams per mil would be equivalent to smoking 600 cigarettes. Now, I'm saying smoking because I'm saying you're getting about a one to two um, milligrams of nicotine from smoking a cigarette. So just get an idea, if a child were to ingest this, it would be equivalent to smoking 600 cigarettes. I know this is a little difficult to see. We have yellow, orange, and then a deeper orange, we'll call it red. Um, I, want, <laughs> I want you all to just look at that graph if you can see it. And this, we're talking about adults. And as you can see, it says adult toxicity. Um, rapid absorption of 2 to 5 milligrams may induce nausea and vomiting, 40 to uh, 60 being lethal. So if you will look under the um, 18 milligrams per mil, which is the 1.8 uh, percent, you will see that that amount is in the orange, okay, the lighter orange, and that is potentially lethal. So that is two mLs. That is less than half of a teaspoon that would be potentially lethal to an adult. And we get calls all the time from adults where, you know, it splashes or it broke and the liquid, rather than being aerosolized, just came out straight into their mouth. Now this is pediatric, and this is for an estimated 10 kilo child. So again, we're going to look for the lighter orange, and you go to the 
24 milligrams per mil, and you come across 0 0.4 mLs. Less than 1 mL is potentially lethal if it were a 2.4 percent or 24 milligram per mil product. And this is using the 1.4 to the 1.8 milligrams per kilogram. So here we have many different products. As you can see, first we have the uh, zero, those that contain zero, which we know from hearing Dr. Wally speak, uh, they may or may not have zero. Then we have the eight milligram, and that would be 0.8%. And that's another thing that's always been very confusing since the liquid nicotine has come out, because I know even for poison centers in 2010, we would see bottles from vape shops that just said 18 milligrams, and we didn't know if it was for the whole 30 mLs or it was per 1 mL. It was a learning curve. It took us about a month for everyone to figure out exactly what it all meant. But this is all per mil, and then 18 milligrams and the 24, and of course there are stronger. There is the 36 that can be purchased, and then the 50 is usually what is used by individual owners that make their own. You can go to vape shops and get custom you know, you can get those strawberry pancakes that Dr. Wally was speaking of, and they would use the 50 um, milligrams per mil and then dilute it down with the propylene glycol and put in the flavoring. So what is the source of nicotine? Well, it is tobacco. And as Dr. Wally had pointed out earlier, some of them say it n contains no tobacco. But if it has nicotine in it, it contains tobacco. So we have your tobacco growing in the field, and then the conventional way of it being dried, and you can see the man that's drying it's even partaking because he's smoking a cigarette. And then after the nicotine has been extracted, then it is put into the e-liquid for the refills for the electronic cigarettes. But what are some other sources? Well, as you see on the right, we have the structure for nicotine, and it can be made, um, you know, be manufactured, but it is so cost prohibitive to make nicotine, it's much easier to extract it that we don't see that being used at all. And those that are very resourceful might know that there's actually trace amounts of nicotine in potatoes. There is 7.1 nanograms per gram of nicotine in a potato. So basically to get one microgram of nicotine, you'd have to get almost five ounces of potatoes. Now remember, what you get from smoking a cigarette is one milligram. So to get one milligram, you would need 294 pounds of potatoes. I'm going to go a step further. You know that bottle that you saw earlier, the 30 ml bottle? In order to have that 30 ml bottle, have it a 1.8 percent or 2.4 percent, over 150,000 pounds of potatoes to make that 30 ml bottle. So I don't think it's very, you know, cost effective to make nicotine from potatoes. Now, in this article, which is going to be a little difficult to see in the next page, so I do encourage people to look it up if they would like to see it in a better light. Um, this was done in 2015, and it was a comparative analysis of products from the U.S., Korea, and Poland. Of course, I'm just going to look at the U.S. products. Now, you probably can't read this, so I will help you. Uh, if you go to the fifth product down, it's a product called uh, Dragon's Breath, and it says it contains zero milligrams per mil of nicotine. But if you come over a little bit further to the right, when you look at the analysis, it's actually 0 0.9 plus or minus 1. So it's 0 0.8 to 1 milligram per mil of nicotine. So one mil would be equivalent to smoking one cigarette. Now, this will be very hard to see, but if you were to come up from the bottom of that third column uh, to a product called root beer, 
it says it contains 36. But if you go over to the analysis, it's actually between like 35.4 and 37.2. So many of these products, they're not controlled. They're, um, they don't analyze a batch to make sure, you know, do their quality control. They are not regulated. And so it's all over the map as far as what you're going to get. Nobody really knows for sure. And these are products that are branded. These are not even talking about products that may come from an individual shop where they mix their own. So the routes of exposure. Liquid nicotine is absorbed via the skin of either lungs and the gastro gastrointestinal tract, both orally and rectally. Now, in 1977, there was a, an article in Clin Talks about an adult male who was constipated and his friend, and I always love when friends give people advice, um, their friend told them to use a, a nicotine or tobacco enema. So he got five to ten cigarettes and he crushed them up and then he put them in water then he heated the water to make it more comfortable before he used the enema and he infused it and within five minutes he became nauseated and confused so his family not knowing that he had just done this took him immediately to an emergency department where he became bradycardic and hypotensive they were able to treat him and he came out just fine but when he was to a point where he could converse, he did tell them what he had done. Um, it also absorbs through the eye, but the major thing that we see is ocular exposures that result in severe eye irritation. Now we're going to talk about the toxic signs and symptoms from nicotine. Now this is from Gold Franks, and the reference will be at the end of these slides. Um, it's not referenced right there, but it did come from Gold Franks. Okay, you can have a very rapid onset, like the, the man that rectally was exposed. Um, it was literally within five minutes. Here it says 15 minutes to one hour, you're going to see nausea, vomiting, salivation, abdominal pain, bronchorrhea, hypopnea, uh, hypertension, tachycardia, pallor. Then your neurological symptoms. Initially, they're going to be more stimulation, and so you're going to see agitation, anxiety, dizziness, blurred vision, headache, hyperactivity, confusion, tremors, fasciculation, and seizures. Then later, which is not that much later, um, 30 minutes to 4 hours, you will see diarrhea, um, hypoventilation, apnea, bradycardia, hypotension, dysrhythmia, shock. Lethargy, weakness, and paralysis. So first you'll be stimulated, and then you will go into the blockade. So you can see both. Start off one way and end up the other. You can also see madriasis, nystagmus, and diaphoresis. Now, this is NPDS data again, and these are clinical effects that have been seen in children less than are equal to 19 years of age. The, and I want to go ahead and tell you this, people have more than one effect, and so the number, when it looks at the symptomatic, because we're going to look at medical outcome on the next slide, and if somebody's sitting there adding things up, they'll say, well, you had so many that were no effect or non-toxic, but look at all these symptoms. So some of these people had many symptoms. They may have had the GI and the neuro. But anyway, this is national data, and you will see that GI is the number one symptom, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that's what we would expect. Then neuro, a lot of confusion, a lot of agitation, a lot of irritability, a lot of anxiety. And then you see ocular, and that seems to be the third highest. And we have a lot of ocular exposures, people um, that use them for eye drops. That's probably one of the major reasons in adults that they, you know, they don't, Turn on the light, put on their glasses, and read the label. So they unintentionally put the eye, put the drops into their eyes. Some of them aren't actually droppers, but will actually have the little nozzle that looks like an eye drop. So they get put in their eyes. We had one case where the woman got it on her finger and then rubbed her eye. So a lot of ocular exposures. Now we're going to look at medical outcome, and I'm going to have to do 
a lot to explain everything on here. It's a busy slide, plus some of this terminology might not make any sense. The first thing I want to point out, though, is that greater than 45% of them are either no effect or not followed non-toxic. And you may say, what do you mean not followed non-toxic? Well, if something is deemed not toxic or the um, exposure was so trivial and the family does not want to sit at home for four hours, you know, they may leave. So we try to call back and we can't get a hold of them. Because once they find out they're not in any danger, because if we're not going to leave them at home if they're in any danger. So they find out they're not in danger, they may leave. So we may not ever be able to do a follow-up on them. But from the initial history, it was deemed not uh, toxic, not followed. Okay, so let's go to the very first, confirmed non-exposure. You're thinking, why would we have a confirmed non-exposure? And usually we see those when uh, a child supposedly swallowed a battery. We take an x-ray. There's no battery on the x-ray. We can pretty much say they didn't get it. Okay, with these type products, what happens is, um, let's say a person is taking care of their child and they are not the e-cigarette user and the spouse is, and they're not home, and they find uh, the child with this empty bottle. And they call us, and it's total unknown amount, it's an empty bottle, and it's treated as an exposure. And then, you know, within the hour, the spouse comes home and said, hey, that was my bottle, it was empty, and I'm such a good parent, I rinsed it out before I threw it away, and so there was no exposure. Um, as uh, Dr. Wally had mentioned, and we'll mention again, there has been one death. There's been death in 2013 that was outside of this country, and there's been one death in the U.S. Then we have your major effects, as you can see, a small amount, six. Moderate effects. We have seen a lot of moderate effects, and these include all your cardiovascular, as well as your neuro, and those type of things. Um, then you have, we've already talked about the... Uh, no effect and the not followed. Then we have the not followed minimal where we definitely um, would have followed them up but and they were on the borderline but then they disappeared. And then the unable to follow potentially toxic are people that were referred in and either never showed up or uh, they refused referral. And then the unrelated effect would be if someone uh, said they were exposed to the e-liquid and their symptom was something we would never ever expect. And that is rarely used because in the poison world there's always a first time for everything. So we very rarely can say things are unrelated. We may say unknown if related, but it's really going out on a limb to say it's absolutely not related. Unless, you know, they say their eyes burning and they ingested it. That would be, you know, pretty easy if it didn't get in their eye. Okay, now we're going to look at our regional data from the RPCC. So here we have clinical effects. And you see that, again, GI is number one, neuro is number two, but ocular is not number three. We have cardiovascular. We had a lot of tachycardia and bradycardia and dysrhythmias, and this is all in children. So we actually saw a little different picture than they did nationally, which I found very interesting, so I made the next slide, which I looked at all ages just to see what we might see. And here we saw what we saw nationally in children less than 19 years of age. So we do have a little different um, take on what's happening in Alabama. We seem to be having a lot more ocular exposures in adults than we are in children and unfortunately having more cardiovascular symptoms in children as reported to poison centers. Okay, so what about outcome? Again, the same terminology, so I'm not going to explain it again. Uh, we had zero confirmed non-exposure, so nobody came home and claimed the empty bottle. We've had zero deaths. And we basically have also had, you know, uh, greater than 45% no effect. We did not have any not, to um, not followed non-toxic. We were able to get a hold of all of our people. 
uh, we did have a few that were minimal that we were not able to do a follow-up on. There has been the one child death, and it happened December of 2014 in an 18-month-old in New York. The mom was basically just had her back to the child while she was um, fiddling with the television. He seized and never regained consciousness, and he was the first child to die in the U.S. from an e-cigarette nicotine solution. Like I mentioned earlier, there had been another child previously, but it was out of the country. And there have been many, unfortunately, adults. Uh, most of them have been intentional. I'm not sure if it was abuse or not. There have been injections. Uh, and there was a suicide gesture that they uh, put a whole bunch of the uh, e-cigarette liquid into uh, a bottle of alcohol and then drank it. And they basically they had a very concentrated uh, e-liquid supposedly 100 milligrams per mil and had two bottles and poured it into basically two ounces into a bottle of alcohol and drank it. Now the same case, the reason I have this last slide is because when it occurred, it was the first case and it was such a dramatic case that it was under investigation and unfortunately this poor family was not cleared until April of the following year. So. What can we do as healthcare professionals? Now, this is from the website uh, preventchildinjury.org. I love this infographic. It really has a great message. You can download these for free, get posters made. It'd be a great thing to have in clinics or wherever you may see patients or hang it up in schools, wherever you think it might be appropriate. It shows you the increase um, of exposures to liquid nicotine, especially in children. As you saw, even though exposures to poison centers have decreased in all ages, they continue to rise in the less than 19 years of age group. Then, as Dr. Wally had mentioned, um, you see a bowl of candy, they smell like candy, they're sweet. You've got peppermint, you have a strawberry there, you've got all the pretty colors. So there'd be no reason for you not to be interested if you were a child. Now this is the bottom half of the same infographic. And I like this because it, it makes sure that you know that just by swallowing it, you're in danger, but also by touching it. And then it talks about each organ system that we would worry about. So treatment. What a poison center would do after receiving a call about an exposure to an e-cigarette liquid. If the patient was exposed to a dose, which we have calculated to be below the toxic dose, we're going to watch them at home. We're going to remove them from the exposure, you know, take them out of take it out of their hands. We're going to uh, decontaminate the best that we can. We're not going to be giving charcoal or inducing vomiting or anything like that, but we're going to offer them clear liquids. We're not going to recommend milk. They're, because tobacco absorbs differently in an alkaline pH and your stomach is acid, it's probably best not to mess with the stomach acid and just give them some clear liquids like water. Uh, dermally, we're going to wash the skin with soap and water. It needs to be cool water because warm water actually enhances the absorption of nicotine. If it's an ocular exposure, you're going to um, irrigate the eye for 15 minutes with water. And if you know you happen to have some normal saline solution in your house, then use that. More than likely, your e-liquid um, exposure exposures are going to probably all come in. Uh, we are going to irrigate at home first because it's better to go ahead and flush than let them drive to an ED having damage being done the whole time. If it's inhalation, then fresh air. And then we're going to observe them at home for four hours. We'll call back in like 30 minutes, an hour, and four hours to check on them. And if they develop any symptoms, even if it's something minor like nausea and vomiting, then at that point we would be referring them in. I did want to mention something about dermal. If you are washing it off of a child, you want to protect yourself also to make sure that you are not being contaminated. And if you know, it's one of those things where you did witness it, but you just couldn't fly across the room fast enough, and you saw the child 
lick it, and then squirt the rest on the floor. When you go to clean it up off the floor, protect yourself. Wear gloves. Um, if it gets on any clothing, that clothing needs to be removed from the person and also not to contaminate yourself when you wash it. So if they do get a toxic amount, we're going to refer them to an emergency department and we are going to ask how far do you live. If they're 15 minutes away, we're probably going to tell them to call 911. Uh, we're going to recommend that they're observed a minimum of four to six hours and until asymptomatic. And that is so important because we will say this is the time we expect symptoms to occur, usually within four hours. But if they have symptoms, any during that time, we have to watch them even longer to make sure that we don't have any more symptoms. And of course, once they get into an emergency department, which we would call if they called us initially, and we would let the emergency department know that we have referred a patient in, then they can call us back at the 1-800-222-1222. That number is just like 911. No matter where you are in the United States, if you call that number, you will get your local poison center. You will not all come to Birmingham. Thank goodness. <laughs> There'd be a lot of calls because I don't know if we can handle 2.9 million calls. Um, if they're symptomatic when they call us initially, we do recommend that they call 911 if there are any symptoms because it's too risky because seizures can occur within 15 minutes. Now, what else are they using these vaporizing pens for? And this I got from a, a magazine called High Times where they say that people are using it or suggesting that they use it and discussing how they use it with hash oil and uh, marijuana oil. So it is being used for other reasons, these devices that Dr. Wally brought. Also, you have probably heard in the news about them exploding, and it's the battery. It's not the liquid exploding. It's the battery, and there have been many entries. These are the first cases that I have found. Um, I can't see it from here, but I, it's several years ago, and those cases made the national news. Well, there was one just two months ago in Florida well, the guy actually had the vaping pen or the e-cigarette in his mouth when the battery exploded, blew out his teeth, um, blew out a chunk of his tongue, so and also caused burns in his mouth. So it's more than just the nicotine and the, the liquid itself, but the devices can also be a problem. And here are my references. I think there are two pages of them. There we go. And if you have any questions, and now we are going to open it up for questions here. Thank you so much, Dr. Wally and Dr. Slattery. We do have a few minutes for questions, and we do have a few. So the first question we have is, are the people who mix the liquid cartridges at vape stores required to have any specific education like pharmacy technicians do? So while I can't comment on what individual vape stores are doing, uh, we know that there's no federal or state regulation for specific training. Okay. Second question is, this is such a serious issue. Are there any efforts underway at public health in our state to reduce youth smoking and vaping? That's a great question, and the Alabama Department of Public Health is working uh, along with the Centers for Disease Control and multiple other public health agencies. Specifically, there is a tobacco prevention uh, program here in Alabama that's targeting certain cities uh, to educate, but also to uh, advocate for comprehensive smoke-free policies, which include electronic cigarettes. So there is certainly a lot going on in Alabama that we have to be excited and proud about. And the Alabama Department of Public Health, as well as the Centers for Disease Control, are all partnering with Children's of Alabama, for example, and other health care agencies. Thank you. OK. Uh, here's another question. Dr. Slattery, I think you may have covered this, but if you could just maybe reiterate it. 
Are other are smoking cessation products like gum and patches just as dangerous for toddlers and babies as the e-cigarette liquid? That is a great question. The patches are a great concern because of the concentration. There's such a large amount. As you may have noticed in that slide, it's 15 to 52 milligrams in a patch, mm -hmm. so it can be a, a big problem. Not only choking on the on a patch uh, before it's removed, um, but also if they chew on the patch and you know it can have rapid absorption even from the mouth. Now from the gum, also because they're less likely to have the the stomach irritation that you might get from cigarette tobacco, which is very very irritating. Now nicotine is always causing nausea and vomiting, but that could be systemic. Whereas with your like cigarettes, uh, your tobacco, your leaf tobacco, it's actually irritating and can cause nausea and upset stomach, uh, you know, quicker. So. Also, it's more concentrated. The gum is also more concentrated. So if they were to get four or five pieces and chew them, they could hold them in their mouth and have, you know, actually a greater absorption or swallow them and still have some absorption. So, yes, both of those would be considered very toxic. So would you advise healthcare providers to advise families to keep all those products locked up or out of reach? of babies and young children just like you would toxic substances in the home. Exactly. We actually recommend lock boxes, not just up and out of reach. Mm -hmm. We want it out of sight and in something with a key or a combination. So put it in a locked box. Great advice. But we don't want our viewers who are healthcare professionals to be scared of using these FDA evidence-based, um, you know, smoking cessation, tobacco dependence treatments like the nicotine gum, like the nicotine patch. Right. When used correctly and, of course, out of reach of children, you know, they are very effective and double the chance that smokers are going to stop smoking. Okay. Excellent point, Dr. Wally. I think we may have time for one or two more questions. Uh, we do have a few more. Does vaping cause mouth cancer just like chewing tobacco does? Do we know anything about that or is that one of those unknown questions that future research needs to inform us? I would say that it's definitely one of the things, uh, you know, oral cancers of course with tobacco use is a known um, an adverse outcome, but the evidence is really not there yet for electronic cigarettes. Okay. And I don't think we have, we have one more, unless we have more come in. Um, are there any laws about vape shops having to be a certain distance away from a school? I heard you mention that your vape shop that you visited was less than a mile away from your, your local high school. Um, there's nothing uh, in our in the state of Alabama, but each municipality can make those zoning requirements uh, if they so choose. If a, if a community feels it is very important that a vape shop or a hookah uh, shop is not close to a school or close to a hospital, then that can be something that they, that community chooses for itself. But currently, there's nothing uh, within our state that prevents that. Okay. Great points. Any questions from our live audience? Okay, we have no more questions. Oh, wait, we have one more that's just come in. Are there any efforts currently to educate middle and high school children about e-cigarettes if they are receiving wrong information through ads? Another great question, and through the Alabama Department of Public Health, Youth Tobacco Prevention Program that is, um, we're targeting uh, youth, both in middle and high schools, for the, the very message that you bring up that, you know, we want to counter the messages that they're receiving in the media by celebrities with the, the facts, because that's what our youth want. They need the true facts, and that's uh, part of this collaboration through the Alabama Department of Public Health. Okay. Uh, we have no more questions coming in, so I believe that concludes our presentation for today. I want to thank both of our 
uh, wonderful speakers, Dr. Susan Walling, Dr. Ann Slattery. And please remember that this presentation will be archived on the Alabama Department of Public Health website for later viewing. So thank you very much for joining us and for your interest in this very important topic.